Hi, this is Victor Perez. I'm a film director and a visual effects supervisor. And I would like to discuss with you what makes a monitor a good monitor. Because, of course, everybody knows a bit about monitors and everybody knows a lot about software and other pieces of hardware like graphics cards and processors, hard drives. But sometimes we forget that the key piece of hardware is what you see on the screen. So make sure the screen is going to represent exactly what is in the file. So what you see is what you got. So things that I would like to, to discuss in here are going to be related to a monitor that I really love, that is a new release from ASUS, from the ProArt line, which is the PA32DC. This is a monitor that has been created for filmmakers and for colorists. You can even use it on set for checking a color on set for DIT or uh, directors of photography, cinematographers, filmmakers, directors, is like a high-grade precision monitor. I'm going to use this monitor as an example of why this monitor is good, because it's not just the price tag, it's the most important to understand why are you buying that monitor? Why do you need it? And then to understand the characteristics. What else is making the monitor to be good or good enough or the best solution because that is what you want at the end of the day. The first element is going to be the panel. So in this case, we have an OLED panel and it's not just any OLED, it's just a pure RGB OLED. What is the point of the OLED? Well, in general, OLED uh, screens have a very high contrast ratio. Why? Well, because the OLED are self-illuminating, so you don't need a backlight. Usually, other technologies, non-OLED, require back illumination. So that is going to create the black levels to be not so black. And when we relate that with the contrast ratio, that is actually a very big deal. First of all, what is the contrast ratio? The contrast ratio is something very simple, is how dark are your black levels and how bright are your highlights. So the ability that has your monitor to create a deeper black and a higher brightness level, that is actually the contrast ratio. But it's not just that, it's just how they live together. So sometimes you are going to have technologies that are going to require backlighting and you're going to have that bleeding of the light to enter into the black areas. So that is just going to contaminate the blacks and is going to result in dirty blacks. So you want something that the black levels are going to be pure and very, very dark. So dark that actually it's like there is no light in it. So that will be the goal. But something that you have to keep in mind is like, depending on what is the kind of production that you want to, to put on the screen, if it's like HDR, you are going to need a very rich contrast ratio. But not just that, because the contrast ratio is not the only important part, but the amount of details that you can get in the black areas or the dark or the shadows, whatever you want to call it, or the highlights, the bright areas. So you need to understand that the amount of detail is the key part of the uh, panel, of the monitor itself. So for that, the contrast ratio needs to be related to the bit depth. In an unusual traditional monitor of 8 bit, you are going to have something like 16 million and 700 and something amounts of colors available. Well. That is good enough for your eye if you are going to work in the range of, you know, the 8-bit range. But with HDR, you are going to require a higher amount of detail. So you need more colors to be shown because with high dynamic range, you are going to stretch the ability of show details. So if you stretch the 8-bit, you are going to have like banding, which is when you feel the colors are like 
you know, creating bands. So you feel the step between the gradients and you don't want to see that. You want a perfectly smooth gradient. So when you are uh, considering the contrast ratio, you need to keep in consideration as well the bit depth. Well, in this monitor, the PA32DC, you have 10 bits and is HDR ready, so you can work in, in HDR in different formats that I'm going to go across uh, later. But you have a contrast ratio, which is the highest bright divided by the uh, darkest black, and the ratio of those numbers is going to be 1 million to 1. That means that you have 1 million steps in between for getting that contrast ratio. And that is really, really good, especially for high dynamic range. So the contrast ratio and the dynamic range, that is something to keep certainly in mind. Let me just give you a piece of advice. Now production is just going towards HDR and HDR is here to stay. It's not just something that is gonna happen um, just for a period of time. And then maybe we are going back to the, to the previous system. There is no way back. Everything is pointing to go towards HDR. So investing in HDR is actually investing into the future. So soon monitors that are not HDR are just going to be obsolete. You need to see what the audience is going to see on the screen. So you need the good control. Regarding the color spaces that you can display on this monitor, you have sRGB, Rec. 709, Rec. 2020, DCI-P3, Dolby Vision, HDR, like the regular standard or interpret also the metadata. Uh, so you have plenty of possibilities. Every color space has their own function in the filmmaking or even in the graphics art. So you can use this monitor for even photography or motion design or graphic design, architecture, every task that requires a color precision display. And on top of that, you are going to have the Dolby Vision capabilities of the monitor. So you can actually visualize a Dolby Vision content, which is the highest level of HDR uh, that I consider uh, out there. So it's one of the best uh, systems for, for HDR and it's actually very, very popular. What is important is that for me, I will work on the widest color space. And usually, even in, in if you are working with the Rec 2020 color space, which is like the proper color space for HDR, actually the content is going to be distributed in the DCI-P3. So the Rec 2020 is actually a super, super big color space, but actually inside that color space that is just a wrapper or a container, is just going to contain the uh, DCI-P3, which is the color space that we use to produce content for cinema or for HDR output. So with this monitor, you actually can get 99% of the DCI-P3, which is practically everything. It's not just the space, but also the precision. The monitor has to position every color in the right position of that space. So, of course, the data is going to have a perfect address, but the monitor needs to interpret that address in the color space and display the color in the right way. So that is calculated with a delta error. It's a standardized uh, way of calculating the error between what you see and the data that has been emitted, that is displayed. So the delta error is keeping in consideration the ability that the human being has to understand color steps. So when you are in less than one delta error, it's actually less than the ability of the human being to feel the difference. So saying that delta error less than one is the same as saying perfect color. Um, of course, being perfect would be like error equals zero. Delta error zero is like the paramount, but actually working with uh, a delta error of less than one is perfect for us. Even less than two would be good enough for working with CG. More than two, mm, not so good. But when we are working in 
color critical operations, like a color correction, for instance, you need a delta error of less than one. Because what you see on the screen, you need to be sure is what is going to be on the best projector or the best display ever. So that's why having the delta error is actually very important. I mentioned before that the calibration is really important. Well, usually you should calibrate your display as often as you can. I will say that once a week is actually a, a good frequency if you are constantly working, because again, you have to make sure the display is constantly being refreshed in the calibration. The nice thing about this monitor is that it can self-calibrate. So you just program it to do it while you are away, maybe during the night or early in the morning or even the break. If you want to watch it, you can watch it, but it takes time. And it has a, a tiny sensor on the top of the screen that is just going to be placed automatically over the screen and it's going to calibrate and it's going to refresh the calibration of the screen for you. Everything is uh, automated and you can do it as often as you like. You can even do it every night. Of course, that would be like a bit obsessive, but just make sure you are doing your calibration often. Other characteristics that are important is, for instance, the response time. So how fast it's going to be to change from one frame to another without leaving any residual light in there. So with this monitor, for instance, you have at 0.1 milliseconds. And that is actually really, really fast. So you can see smooth transitions and you see the actual pixel by pixel in frame by frame uh, elements of the screen. So you are not going to be mixing lights in, in there. So it's image in motion. So when you are talking about the response time, you are actually referring to the motion ability of the of the monitors. That also is going to avoid to have like strange artifacts that can create like a honestly a headache because you see the image being ghosting and, and blending with each other. So that is something I, I will advise to have like the lowest uh, response times uh, as possible. Just to put you into context, um, when we are working at a, you know, the usual frame rate of 24 frames per second, that is the, the frame rate, uh, the actual time uh, that you need for the refresh, the good one, will be like 1 48th of a second just to have the time for, you know, closing the, the shutter and opening the, clash, the, the shutter. So that is like the capturing time. So if you have like 1 24th of a second, that is the time that it's going to re require on the screen to change, okay? So if you want to have double the that, so you have like uh, double the speed, 1 48th is going to be good enough. But again, uh, one millisecond is actually a lot. It's like a, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the length of a frame when you are capturing. The monitor itself has been thought to be also on set. So it has a this amount, so you can put it into a cart of DIT or, or cinematographer, so it can be on set. And having an asset of this kind on set is going to provide you a very precise feedback of what the camera is capturing. So if you have to modify something, of course, you can do it first of all on set. So having critical precision on set for filmmakers is paramount. The ability that this monitor has to be mounted into the structures that we always use for, for filmmaking on set in location or on studio is actually very versatile. So you can be sure the monitor is going to be solid and rock steady in the place that it should be. So it's going to be always available for, for you. But before to finish, I would like to mention that having a critical representation of the image on the screen doesn't depend exclusively of the monitor. It's also the light in the environment that you are placing the monitor. So how do you calibrate your environment? Actually, this monitor has the calibrator that is used for the screen, of course, but it has also a double function. So you can use the sensor to understand the quality of the light that you are receiving around the monitor. So it's going to tell you if you have a detonant that is going to condition the way you see the screen and it's going to advise you to regulate the amount of light and the color of the light. So that is 
amazing because it's keeping in consideration all the factors that you need in order to get the right image on the screen to be visualized as you need it. So the Asus ProArt Monitor PA32BC is the perfect monitor for filmmakers and visual artists. Well, it's the perfect monitor for me. Why shouldn't it be for you?